Today's sermon is entitled, Who's Watching You? And it's a story about one of the Bible's great villains. This is in many ways a terrible story, even a horrible story. But stories are in the Bible for a reason. There are lessons to be learned. Bible stories are not just for entertainment. They are about character. There was a king of Israel named Omri. He was rich and powerful. He built a capital city on the hill of Samaria. The Bible calls it an ivory palace. For years, the skeptics scoffed. You can't build a palace out of ivory, they said. Well, they were certainly right. But about a hundred years ago, there began to be found all around the hill of Samaria little ivory plaques like this one, carved with decorative designs. They had once been overlaid with gold. And the archaeologists finally discovered the truth. Omri's palace was not built out of ivory, it was built out of stone but its interior was completely overlaid with ivory plaques. That's why the Bible called it an ivory palace. Now, Omri wanted to be even more rich and powerful and important. So he arranged a marriage between his son and the daughter of the king of Sidon. The Bible speaks often of Tyre and Sidon. They were great cities of the Phoenicians, and they were great port cities on the Mediterranean Sea. They had a powerful seagoing merchant empire. Omri was rich, but the king of Sidon was rich beyond belief. So the daughter of the king of Sidon moved to Samaria and married Omri's son. Very shortly after this, Omri died, and this son and daughter-in-law became the rulers of Israel. The son's name was Ahab, and his wife was Jezebel. Now Ahab was a complicated man, but Jezebel was straightforward. With Jezebel, what you see is what you get. There was no deviousness or subtlety about her. She came straight at you. And she didn't believe in Yahweh. She came from a Canaanite culture where there were many gods. But the favorite one was Baal. They pronounced it Baal. And Jezebel believed in Baal. Baal, the storm god, the god of rain and thunder, the god who made the crops grow. Jezebel also came from a country where the king ruled. He could do anything he wanted. And so, in the king's name, she began promoting Baal worship. And she began to murder the prophets of Yahweh. She followed this same course all through her whole life. She was consistent to the end. When an army officer named Jehu... finally came to execute her, she met him head on. She taunted him. She put on her makeup and stared him down. She knew she was going to die in five minutes or less, but her hauteur, her pride never left her. Her servants threw her out the window, but she was Jezebel to the end. Her husband Ahab was a far more complex individual than she was. Many people describe him as being weak and even henpecked, but he was not. And he was very complicated. Let's see what we know about him. In order to explain Ahab, we need to step aside for just a minute and tell a story about a country. 
far up north in the headwaters of the Tigris River was the country of Assyria. Its land was bad for farming. It had no natural resources. So they found another way to get rich. They became raiders and they raided all over the Middle East. And they had a huge army. Every teenage boy in the nation got his draft notice and spent his life in the Assyrian army. If you were an Assyrian boy, that was your career. The huge Assyrian army fought every year all over the world, from the first day of spring till the last day of fall. And every year, on the first day of winter, they arrived back home. And for 200 years, they never lost a battle. People like the Babylonians and the Assyrian and the Romans, I'm sorry, people like the Babylonians and the Romans wanted to rule the world. The Assyrians never wanted to rule anything. They just wanted to loot it. So every year they fought all over the world and they hauled off all the booty they could carry. And everywhere they left behind a list of demands. On New Year's Day, you must deliver to us in our capital city, Nineveh, so much gold, so much silver, so many slaves, so many cows, so many horses, donkeys, camels. And this annual tribute was enormous. The Assyrians would take in taxes every year about 60% of the whole world's income. The prophet Nahum cried against them. Woe to the city of blood, packed with evil, stuffed with booty, where plundering has no end. The crack of the whip, the rumble of wheels, galloping horse, jolting chariot, charging cavalry, flashing swords, gleaming spears. Masses of wounded, hosts of dead, countless corpses. That's Nahum 3, 1 to 3. And every year, on New Year's Day, every little country paid its taxes. Here is Omri, king of Israel, paying his Assyrian taxes and kissing the feet of the Assyrian king. Everybody paid their taxes because everybody knew that on the first day of spring, the Assyrians were coming. And woe betide the little country that hadn't paid. The city would burn to the ground. The soldiers would be skinned alive. The officials would be staked to the ground and their bellies opened for the birds. The rest of the men would just be impaled. Women and children were sold as slaves. And so, every year, everybody paid their taxes. But one year, a shocking thing happened. A series of letters went out to all the little kingdoms of the Middle East. The letters said, this year I am not going to pay my Assyrian taxes. Who will stand beside me? The whole world reeled in shock and terror. Nobody was this bold. Could anybody be so crazy? Oh yes, one man was. Most countries pretended they had never seen the letters. On that New Year's Day, just like on every New Year's Day, mountains of gold and silver, livestock and fancy goods and slaves poured into Nineveh from every country in the world. That is, from every country but one. There was no tribute from Israel because the letters were signed, Ahab, king of Israel. On the first day of spring, the Assyrian armies went on the march, headed for Israel. But Ahab didn't wait for them. He went north to meet them. They met at, they met at Karkar and a very large battle took place. For some unknown reason, the Bible tells us absolutely nothing about this story. 
but it really happened. It's one of the best documented and most important events in ancient history. The battle between Ahab and the great Assyrian army took place on June 14, 853 BC. The whole world rocked in horror and amazement. But then something very strange happened. A few weeks later, Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, was back in his capital city of Nineveh. He erected this monument of his victory over the Israelites. On it, he said simply, I met Ahab of Israel at Karkar, and I beat him. But there are three curious and interesting things about this inscription. First of all, the inscription was dated in the spring. But every year, without fail, for 200 years, the Assyrian armies were fighting all spring, all summer, and all fall. They never returned to Nineveh until the first day of winter. The walls of the Assyrian temples and palaces are covered with battle records, and they're all dated in the winter. For some reason, this time, and this time only, the Assyrians returned home six months early. The second thing that's strange about this inscription is that it does not record the booty or the spoil. The Assyrians love to boast about their battles in great and bloody detail. They carve these stories on the walls of their cities and government buildings and temples, and they would end these stories with a list of all the prisoners and all the spoil and all the booty they had carried off in exhausting detail. But in the record of the Battle of Karkar, there are no battle details. There is no mention of prisoners or of spoil or of booty. All Shalmaneser said was, I met Ahab of Israel at Karkar and I beat him. The third peculiar thing is that without fail, for 200 years, the Assyrian armies fought every year. But for five years after Karkar, they stayed home. They weren't seen anywhere. And for 30 years, they never went west toward Karkar or toward Israel. So what really happened at Karkar? The answer is quite clear. The historians are unanimous. Ahab beat the daylights out of them. It was the most shocking upset victory in the ancient world. The huge Assyrian juggernaut was clobbered and clobbered hard for the only time in 200 years. The invincible Assyrian army with 200,000 soldiers and 30,000 chariots was beaten by Ahab of Israel with 10,000 soldiers and 2,000 chariots. The popular view of Ahab is that he was an indecisive, henpecked weakling. But the Battle of Karkar was not the work of an indecisive, henpecked weakling. And there is more. Because next, there were the Syrian Wars. The Bible never mentions Karkar, but it has a lot to say about the Syrian wars in the book of 1 Kings. And in these wars, Ahab beat his northern neighbor, Syria, again and again. Now note, this is Syria, not Assyria. The names sound almost identical to us, but in the original languages, they are very different. Totally different unrelated countries. And very interestingly, the record of these wars in the books of Kings shows that Ahab carefully followed the guidance of the prophets of Yahweh. Before every battle, he asked a prophet's advice, and every time he followed it, and every time he won. Ahab gave his children good Yahweh-worshiping names, Adonai Yah, Yahweh is my Lord. 
Athaliah, daughter of Yahweh. Yehoram, Yahweh is great. Over the years, many bad Jewish kings gave their children pagan names, but not Ahab. His kids got good, God-fearing names. We can assume that Jezebel didn't like this, but Ahab named them despite her and gave them names from the religion of his fathers. And next, there's the story of Naboth's vineyard. You know this story. Listen to how well the Bible tells it. I'm going to read it to you directly. Now a man named Naboth had a vineyard close to the palace of Ahab. And Ahab said to Naboth, Let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden, since it is close to my palace, and I will trade you a better vineyard, or I will pay you anything you ask. But Naboth replied, Yahweh forbids that I should sell the land of my ancestors. So Ahab went home, sullen and angry. He lay on his bed and refused to eat. Jezebel came in and asked him, Why are you so angry? Why won't you eat? He answered her, Because Naboth said to me, I will not sell you my vineyard. Jezebel said, Is this how the king of Israel should act? Get up and eat. I'll get you that vineyard. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name. She placed his seal on them. He sent them to the elders of Naboth's vineyard, of Nabar's village. She wrote, get two scoundrels and have them testify that Naboth has cursed both God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. So the elders and nobles did as Jezebel directed. They proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth in a prominent place. Then two scoundrels came and said, Naboth has cursed both God and the king. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death. Then they sent word to Jezebel, Naboth has been stoned. He is dead. As soon as Jezebel heard this, she said to Ahab, Go, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth. He is no longer alive, but dead. Ahab got up and went down to take possession of Naboth's vineyard. Then the word of Yahweh came to Elijah the prophet. Go down and meet Ahab, king of Israel. He is now in Naboth's vineyard. And Elijah went. Ahab said to Elijah, So you have found me, my enemy. I have found you, Elijah answered, because you have done evil in the eyes of Yahweh. He will bring disaster on you because you have caused Israel to sin. Now notice the picture of Ahab that is emerging. He is a complicated and conflicted man. The law of Moses forbids anyone to sell away the land he inherited from his forefathers. Naboth was following the law. And Ahab had respect for the laws of the Bible. When Naboth said, Yahweh forbids me to sell the land of my ancestors, Ahab stopped. He wouldn't violate the Bible laws. He wouldn't kill a man for following them. But he would look the other way if his wife violated the law on his behalf. Now down at the end of the story, when Elijah confronted Ahab about this crime, what did Ahab do? This is a part of the story that I bet you don't remember. The Bible says Ahab repented. When Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and walked with meekness. The Bible says Ahab's repentance was genuine. He knew he had done wrong, and he was sorry. God heard his prayers, 
and delayed the punishment. And finally, there is one last great Ahab story. The encounter on Mount Carmel. God had sent a three-year drought on the land, and the famine was severe. People were starving. And finally, Elijah sent word to Ahab, Summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel, and bring the 450 prophets of Baal who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah stood before the people and said, How long, how long will you wobble between two opinions? If Yahweh is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of Yahweh's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. So kill two bulls and put them on the two altars. Then you call on the name of Baal, and I will call on the name of Yahweh. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people answered, what you say makes sense. It is good. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. Oh, Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered, and they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Maybe he's deep in thought. Maybe he's traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and needs to be awakened. Or maybe he's gone to the bathroom. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed. They continued their frantic dancing until the time of the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. No one heard. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. They came to him, and he repaired the altar of Yahweh, which was in ruins. He took twelve stones, one for each of the tribes of Israel, and put the altar back together again. Then he dug a trench around it. He arranged the wool, the wood, he cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large water jars and pour them on the offering and on the wood. They did it. Do it again, he said. They did it again. Do it a third time, he said. And they did it the third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of the evening sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Yahweh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, let it be known today that you are God in Israel. Answer me, Yahweh, answer me, so that these people will know that you are God and that you will turn their hearts back to yourself again. Then the fire of Yahweh fell and burned up the sacrifice and the wood, and the stones, and the soil, and licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell on their faces and cried, Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. Elijah said, seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. So they seized them. The people brought them down to the Kaishan Valley and slaughtered them all. And Elijah said to Ahab, Quick, get home for supper, for there is the sound of a heavy rain. And Elijah ran before the chariot of Ahab all the way to the gate of Jezreel through a blinding torrent of rain, the first rain in three years. 
But when he got there, the messengers of Jezebel met him. May the gods do so to me, and even more, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like the lives of the prophets of Baal you killed. And you know the story. Elijah ran. He ran all the way to Mount Horeb in Arabia, and he hid in a cave. Now, was Ahab angry that Elijah killed Baal's prophets? Ellen White has a fascinating take on this whole story and adds a lot of interesting detail that are found nowhere else. She says that Ahab was actually pleased to rub this in Jezebel's face. He may not have said it out loud, but the smirk on his face nearly shouted at her, the religion of my fathers just beat the religion of your fathers. He probably didn't say it in those words, but he felt it. They both felt it. There are many critical turning points in the history of the nation of Israel, and here was one of them. In one of her writings, Ellen White said that if Elijah had not turned coward and run from Jezebel, there would have been a sweeping reformation in Israel. The course of history would have been changed, but Elijah ran. How much hangs on our little acts of self-pity or cowardice? The course of the world might have been different. And what does Ellen White say about Ahab? She says that if Elijah had stood firm, Ahab would have stood with him. Shocker. Wicked King Ahab. Weak, impact Ahab. Maybe not. Elijah didn't know it. But Ahab was looking for an excuse to take a stand. Elijah could have given it to him, and he didn't. In fact, Elijah's cowardly flight might have been one of the most tragic events in Bible history. The one time Elijah set a bad example, it may have tipped the balance, and Ahab, this powerful and complex man, may have lost his soul. Okay, somehow things got messed up here. Okay. Ahab was watching Elijah. He wanted an excuse to turn the country back to Yahweh, but the tides were against him. His advisors were against him. His wife was against him. Many of the people were against him. The current against him was strong. He was looking for an ally. He watched Elijah. Elijah's miracles were impressive. Elijah's preaching gave him hope. And when Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal on top of Carmel, Ahab saw the opportunity come. Now was the time. He hurried back to Jezreel in the blinding rainstorm. Now he and Elijah could turn the nation around. But then Elijah ran. Elijah, the great Elijah, the man who went to heaven in a chariot of fire, the man who stood beside Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, Elijah failed in the most important moment of his life. Somebody was watching him, a man struggling with his demons, a man battling fierce temptations, a man who needed him, a man who just might have changed the world, a man looking for just a little help to follow God. And Elijah let him down. Is there an Ahab watching you? At work? In your family? Somewhere in your circle of friends? Might be a person with character and ability. A leader. Somebody that appears to be worldly. Maybe you even think they're wicked. Maybe you're saying to yourself, this person would never become a Christian. 
Maybe you're also saying, this important person would never notice me or pay any attention to what I did. But just maybe, they're watching you. And just maybe, they might take a stand if you take one. If you disappoint this person, you may never hear about it. But if you take the stand they're hoping for, the world might become a different place. Is there an Ahab watching you? Let's pray. Father in heaven, there are people watching us. We pray for the grace to take a stand when they need us to. We pray not to let them down when they need our example. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, who never let anyone down.